This is worth trying on a side project. Yeah, tell me. Hanami. Hanami. Ah, oh, I hear it's hit 2.0. Hanami 2. From the depths of the internet, for Ruby apps of all shapes and sizes, years in the making, bringing new levels of polish and power to a framework near you. Hanami 2.0 is out. Tim, our next speaker, is a core member of Hanami, Dry RB, and Rom RB, and a principal engineer at BuildKite, one of our sponsors here today. He's been writing Ruby uh, for over 20 years, and he still loves it. He works to bring the joy of Ruby uh, to writing real, maintainable apps of all shapes and sizes. 20 years of Ruby. I'm sure Tim is preparing, Tim. Oh, for his open source uh, Hanami work, he's working asynchronously with collaborat collaborators in Rome and Krakow. Is that right? Uh, Krakow, yeah, that's good, that's good. <laughs> he says the collaboration is extremely asynchronous and it feels like it's happening through a straw. But in this case, what they've released is Hanami 2 and it's a testament to just how well aligned the team are. Tim Riley, Hanami 2, new framework, new you. Hi everyone, I'm Tim. I am really happy to be here today. Uh, it's an exciting time to be gathered again. Just a bit about me. I work at BuildKite. We make fast and flexible CI CD for all kinds of developers. We do it here in Australia and New Zealand and we do it with Ruby, which is really cool. I also do some work in open source uh, in Ruby, uh, namely these projects, Hanami, DryRB and ROMRB. And you can probably guess uh, what we'll be talking about today. And that's Hanami. Uh, Hanami, in a nutshell, is an app framework for Ruby. And it's the perfect time to be sharing it because just at the end of last year, we've released our 2.0 release. And I'm really excited for the possibilities it might unlock, not only for the shape of Ruby apps, but also for each of us as Ruby developers. Now, I conceived of this talk at the end of last year, and the coming new year was on my mind, and New Year's resolutions, of course, so we have the new framework, new U title, but, well, it's getting on, it's mid-Feb, and I thought, well, I'm up for resolutions at any time of year, but maybe this is a chance to come up with a different tagline, a different title. And so I thought, well, what would be the theme? Well, we're back. Uh, we're gathered here again after three years break, RubyConf AU is back, I can stop pinching myself, it's day two. Getting on the beers uh, is optional, of course, uh, I may have one after this. But I think that's our theme, let's see how we can introduce an army while injecting a bit of Australian flavour at the same time. So uh, I, took a, I took a run at a few uh, Aussie inspired titles. Uh, for starters, we could talk about the run towards Hanami 2.0, oh, oh. Uh, here we have a, a seminal moment in Australian sporting history, and maybe this release can be a, a similar moment uh, for this project. So that's a start. Uh, I think we can do more. Parents in the room might know what's coming next. Yes, uh, we can talk about Hanami 2 for real life. Bluey is probably Australia's number one cultural export right now. And I could only hope for some small measure of the success that they've found. And at the same time, I'd love to share some of the joy and passion that we see in Bluey and Bingo. We can stay on the small screen for a bit, perhaps more from my own childhood. Uh, we can flip to Channel 2, uh, celebrate Hanami 2 and friends. You can turn your Ruby apps upside down, upside down. Mr. Squiggle, uh, what we're seeing here, uh, had a real ability to take an inscrutable pattern and turn it into something cohesive and surprising. Well, maybe Hanami could help us do that for our Ruby code. One more. And I have to thank Pat for bringing some political vibes yesterday. Uh, this one's for the Ozpol crowd. Uh, Hanami 2, it's time. With it's time, Whitlam brought in progressive and reformist energy to Australia after 20 years of, well, not. Uh, and this feels pretty strong. I can, I can vibe with this one. I think, as Pat made very clear, we should not rest on any laurels in the Ruby community. Maybe it's time for something new. But ultimately, what I want to get across is that with this framework, well, maybe we can find a place that will help us uh, continue to call Ruby home, uh, to remain in this community and with this technology that we know and love while still growing and still learning. So let's get into it. Let's 
learn a bit about how we got here with Hanami for starters. Uh, the project's been around since 2014, and when it was released, uh, it was advertised as a simple, fast, lightweight web framework, bringing a focus on maintainability and testability. Then just a year later, in 2015, the DryB project began, and that's where I was working at the time, and we too had a strong emphasis on trying to help Rubyist build more maintainable applications. So it wasn't long before we realized that both teams were working towards the same goal, so we joined forces, and after a busy four or five years later, um, we've shipped 2.0. And now we have something that brings the power and flexibility of DryB with a friendly and streamlined, out-of-the-box experience. I'm talking today, but this was a real team effort, so I want to share a shout out to these legends here, uh, particularly Luca and Peter, my teammates on the core team. So here's our plan for today. Uh, three phases, we're going to do some building to get to know Hanami. Uh, from there, we'll learn more about what the framework can offer, and lastly, we'll take a look at how that might help us grow and see Ruby in a new light. So let's get started. We can gem install Hanami, and from here we can create a new app for today. And we'll call ours Bookshelf. And we can start our tour by checking out the app class itself. And this is nice and simple. We won't need to dwell too long here. But there is one thing I want to point out at this stage, and that it is in Hanami apps, all your code lives within a single namespace, matching the app's name. So here we have module Bookshelf. Uh, this is where all our code will live. Next, we can go check out the routes. And this is uh, very simple too. In a new Hanami app, we just have this basic starter route, which is giving us this welcome string here. So from this beginning, we need to make our app real. The first thing we need to do is generate an action. And Hanami gives us a nice generator to do that for us. So for starters, we'll create an apps index action, a books index action. And that went and made a new route for us. And this looks pretty simple. A get request to books will take us to that books index action. And here's the action. This is what the generator made for us. And it's a basic starter action. And the job of an action in a Hanami app is to handle all of our HTTP interactions. And we have exactly one action per endpoint in our app. And it's this handle method that is the most important part of each action, because that's where we tell it how to behave. And we can see here we're given separate request and response objects. And with these, with these objects, we can do things like inspect request parameters or set the response body. So speaking of those request parameters, Hanami actions support flexible param validation schemas, uh, which helps us ensure our parameters meet our expectations, both in terms of their structure and their types. And since this is an index action, uh, we'll want a couple of optional params, a page number and a per page value. And for both of these, we want to make sure that they're integers and greater than zero. And that gives us a chance to return an error response if any of those parameters are not valid. So we can see here that actions give us a range of helpful features for handling those HTTP interactions. But this is a books index. Uh, where are we going to do the job of our business logic? How can we fetch the books that we want to display? Well, this is where we get to know one of Hanami's most important features. And that is, in Hanami, our app is also a container. And a container here serves as a central organizing object that's responsible for loading and managing access to all the components in our app. Our action is already a component, and we can fetch it from the app like this using uh, a key that matches its name. And what we get back is an instance of that action ready to be used. In fact, any class that we put into app will be made available to us as a component. So in our case, let's go and make a component now for a book repo, something that can return a list of books for our action. And it could look something like this. Since we put it in the app repos directory, we'll give it a matching namespace uh, inside Bookshelf. And then we can add a method for some of the latest books that we've read. Now, this is clearly a stand-in for something that connects to a real data source. But for the sake of our little starter app, it'll do. So now we have two components. We have our action, and we have our repo. But how do we get them to know about each other? What we really want is for our repo to be available inside the action to get our books. And for this, we can use Hanami's depths mixin. 
we can include this mixin inside any class in a Hanami app, whether it's a, an action or any other sort of class, and then pass in a list of components that we want to have as dependencies, depths, dependencies. And those components become available as instance methods, backed by instance variables and all the shapes and sizes. And we can use them wherever we need inside our classes. And using depths like this is central to how we can create high-level behavior by bringing together a range of smaller, more focused components. And in this case, we can now use the latest books from our books repo to make a JSON response that we return from our action. So after all of that, we can now run our Hanami server, good old Puma, uh, where we can see that it works. We can make a request, and here's a list of our books. So well done, everybody. We've made our first working feature with Hanami. Uh, it's helped us to get to know the core of the framework and given us a good spot from which to jump off and explore some more features. And we'll start by looking at the testing experience. How can we test our action? Well, every part of Hanami is designed to be directly testable. So in this case, we can call new directly on our action and even pass in a test double for the book repo dependency. This will let us control its behavior for the purposes of this test. And after that, uh, everything's set up for us to call that action, uh, test its response body, and make sure it meets our expectations. Now, what we see here is a low-level, isolated test. For most actions, we won't want to go this far. A more appropriate kind of test would be an outside-in test, something that makes a request to our app from the outside, runs all the way through, and makes sure it behaves how we want. And those request specs are available in every new Hanami app. But the thing to see here is that because all Hanami components are designed to be directly testable, we get to make the best decision for each testing situation. So we've seen our code through tests. We can also explore it through a console. We can launch the console with the Hanami console command. And then once we're in, we can use this app shortcut to get access to our app. And from there, we can access all of our components, which again, come back as instances ready for us to work with. And this console always starts quickly, no matter the size of the app, because in Hanami 2, we offer two levels of boot mode. The first we call prepare, and that's a lightweight way of booting our app. And it minimizes what it loads up front. And we use this in all aspects of dev, from the tests to the console to even running our dev server, so it means as large as our app may grow, the dev experience remains as snappy as possible. And along with this, we have a more traditional boot uh, process which loads everything up front, which is perfect for pre-forking web servers like Puma. Now, one thing that happens across both, both levels of boot is that Hanami will load our settings. These are the values that we give our app to make sure it behaves correctly in every environment. Things like keys, uh, secrets, and flags. And we can define our settings here. Say we wanted to send uh, from our app some emails whenever new books are added. And to do this, we wanted to use a third-party email API of some kind. Well, here we can add a setting for its API key and specify that we want this to be a string. Hanami will then load these settings from matching environment variables. And in dev, uh, you can use .n files as well to supply them. From there, we can now access our settings as another component in the app, and it comes with, all, uh, with methods for each of the settings that we've just defined, so we can retrieve their values. And we can also include it as a dependency of any object, thanks to our depths mixin. So aside from these settings, so far we've only seen components that have been loaded by us defining classes in our app directory. But what about components that might need some special handling as, as part of their setup? Well, here's uh, where we can use providers. And we need to make one now for our email service. We've already created the setting for its API key. Now we need to go and use it. Providers have their own folder in config. And here we're registering our email service provider. And in every provider, we have a couple of lifecycle steps we can use. So for starters here, we're going to require the gem for the email API client. Then we'll grab our API key from the settings component that we just set up pass it in to configure that client. Whoops. There we go. And then we'll register that client, that object, as a component in our app. 
And this now means that any class using email service as a dependency will get that fully configured client, that very object, ready for them to work with. So by now we've covered nearly everything we need to know about Hanami apps, but there's one more important thing for us to discover, and that's slices. Slices help us organize our app into separate domains or technical concerns, and they're a fantastic way for introducing modularity and clearer internal boundaries to our app as it grows. And I'm really glad that Julian talked yesterday about Rails engines, because I was the whole time I was thinking, this guy's in my brain. Literally everything he said uh, that he showed off with Rails engines, you can also do with slices in Hanami. Except that with Hanami, slices are the heart of the framework. They are part of the, the, the path we recommend people follow as they build their apps. And they appear as soon as you put a single file into the slices directory. Uh, we have a helpful generator that we can also use to get started. So let's make an admin slice. This will prepare an admin slice directory for us. And then we can throw a, a new action into it, a books create action. And just like our app, every slice maps to a single Ruby namespace. So here we're using admin. Hanami will also create a slice class for us to use. And that slice class works exactly like our app, offering access to our components with the only difference being that it's confined to the, to the components inside its slice directory. That's how you get the boundaries. And also, just like the app, slices have their own depths mix in with the same limitation. They only load components from inside the slice. So now we've seen that both the app and slices act as containers for our individual components. And then, thanks to the depths mix in, we can clearly recognize the dependencies between those components, their relationships to each other, and begin to think of them as like a big directed graph. And from here, we can take things one step further, because slices can import components from other slices. And this means we can envision an equally clear graph of all of our app's high-level concerns. This is a really powerful approach. Here we have the tools built right into a framework to help us better organize our code at all levels for easier understanding and maintainability. And slices give us operational flexibility, too, because we can configure the slices that we want to load for specific deployments of our app. And one thing we want to do with Hanami 2 is extend this power to apps of all kinds, not just web apps. Let's go and take a look at the gem file of a brand new Hanami app. What we're seeing here, this, this is a web app, because we have the Hanami router and the Hanami controller gems. However, these are not fixed dependencies of the framework. This is why they're right here in the gem file. So if we wanted to build something different to a web app, all we need to do is remove those extra lines. And with the one Hanami gem we have remaining, we have all the quality of life features that we've just explored. Containers, components, depths, settings, the console, even slices. This means we get to keep everything we need and nothing we don't. And we can put all these features to use for any kind of app. So this means Hanami 2 is no longer just a web framework. It is the everything framework. Say we wanted to build a chatbot, a CLI tool, a serverless function, a stream consumer, but we still want all the conveniences that a full framework can give us. Well, now we can do it all with Hanami. I don't think Ruby has ever seen anything quite like this. And I'm really excited for where people might be able to take it. But uh, for all this flexibility uh, that we've just shared and that we've given to Hanami, I'm sure some of you might have noticed a few things missing, like that connection to a database that I just elegantly smoothed over, uh, or a way to render views. And I just want to be real about this for a minute. Working on a thing for four to five years without release uh, is pretty hard. We're a small team. This is a pure passion project. There's no commercial backing. Uh, and I'm sure all of you know the feeling of a project that drags on for too long. It's draining. But it's 2023, and if there's one thing I've learned recently is that, well, maybe it's okay for things to take their time. <laughs> but by some measures, even we were doing okay. And just to uh, bring back another Aussie vibe, well, life would be pretty straight without a complex multi-year open source project to keep you busy. <sighs> Working across that time period, though, I think it worked out pretty well in the end, because 
Uh, it gave us time uh, for things to take their twists and, and turns, and it helped us to discover exactly the kind of experience that we want to offer uh, with this release of the framework. Uh, but in the end, we had to get something shipped, so we did the one thing we could, and we cut scope. So everything we've seen so far is out. 2.0 released on rubygems.org, uh, and it's now got us as a team in a good place to finish the, the remaining parts. And because you're a few hundred of my closest friends, uh, I want to offer you a bit of a preview. And we can start with database persistence. And to introduce this, I need to share a little bit more about the relationship between Hanami and its sibling projects, all the logos that I showed you before. Everything we've seen so far in Hanami 2 has been built on and around the dry RB gems. So this means when someone picks up Hanami and makes their new app with it, they get to work and learn and get to know some gems that are themselves standalone and independently useful. They're part of a Ruby ecosystem that prioritizes flexibility and support for apps of all kinds. And then what Hanami brings to this is a curated experience that combines these gems with a set of opinions for how they can be used to achieve something that is greater than the sum of its parts. So for database persistence, we are going to do the very same thing just with ROMRB. ROM is a powerful, flexible, standalone database persistence toolkit, and itself has a very long pedigree. So for Hanami 2, we're not going to hide it behind some simplified interface. Instead, we're going to elevate it. So you'll have ev access to every feature of ROM, but we'll provide a nice on-ramp and a helpful set of conventions to make it fit beautifully in a larger app. Let's take a look at how that'll, how that'll work. We can start by revisiting our book repo, uh, the one we made earlier, uh, where we were returning that array of static data. So to make this repo talk to the database, all we'll need to do is have it inherit from our app's base repo class. And this will be generated for us uh, when we create our app. And from there, we can now change our latest method to select what we want from the books table in our database. And here we're using ROM's full-powered query API. And in repos like this, we can add methods for both reads and writes, which turns them into our very own interface to the database. This helps us both separate our persistence logic from our business logic, but it also ensures all of our database is considered and intentional. And then when we call these methods, what we receive are our records from the database returned as instances of our own matching struct classes. And these are simple value objects only. They don't carry any connection back to the database. So this means we can pass them all over our app with confidence, knowing that our repos remain our key interface for interacting with that persistence layer. So that's persistence. We can also look at views. And here we'll see an approach that's hopefully fairly similar to what we've looked at so far. Every view in Hanami has its own class. So here's one for a books index. And just like everywhere else, we can include dependencies here. So since this is our books index, let's bring back that book repo that we just updated. Then in our view, we can create exposures to prepare the values that we want to pass to our template. So in this case, we'll pass the, the latest books from our database. And lastly, in that template, we can work with those values to prepare the HTML that we want to render. Views themselves are components too. This means we can include them as depths in other classes, like here in our books index action, the first thing that we made. Uh, and then inside our handle method, we can now render the view on our response. And at this point, our action is no longer a JSON action. It's returning all of our latest books as HTML. And since rendering an action's matching view is such a common task, Hanami will find that view for us, so we don't even need the depth mix in in cases like this. So that's a preview of persistence and views. We're still figuring out all the minor details, but it should give you a good idea of how these things will broadly fit together. And in the case of views, when we release these, we'll include everything you need to create a full stack web application, including integration with uh, asset bundlers for front end assets. So there we go. We've seen every part of Hanami now, uh, including the bits that are coming soon. Work on those things will happen in the next couple of months. But in the meantime, this is a great chance to get started, uh, get a head start, and get to know all the other parts of Hanami that sit there at the core. Because I'm excited for how it can help us grow as Rubyists. 
And the reason for this is that I think Hanami brings more to the table than just a collection of framework features. It provides a new opinion on what constitutes good app design, and then it embodies these opinions in its own design. And I think we can learn from this and turn this into growth as developers. So how can we grow? Firstly, we can grow our understanding of our app's domain. And Hanami encourages this in a few ways. And the most important of these is that it makes one important thing clear. The framework is not your app. These things are separate. The framework should work in service of our app, not the other way around. So Hanami routes and actions are designed to be as thin as possible a layer, to act as a gateway into our app, which is where our logic resides. The core business logic is ours, and it's supposed to be separate from the framework concerns. From there, if our business logic is separate, well, we have some extra thinking to do. It's on us to figure out how to name and organize that code, to find that right arrangement of concepts manifested as components to make that code the most useful expression of our business domain. And because Hanami makes it easy to decompose our logic into those independent focused components, it gives us a chance to really take control over the shape of our code. So much of this is really about growing our modularity muscle, about boiling things down into those focused components and then composing them to create the high-level behavior that we want to offer our users. It really boils down to figuring out boundaries. And let's be honest, figuring out boundaries is something that's important in every aspect of our lives. But it's important for us to practice as developers, too. We, we, we never stop uh, working on this. So we'll do ourselves a big favor by choosing to work with a framework that acknowledges this vital activity and then provides us the tools to reason about it, like Hanami does with its components, depths, and slices. And this gives us a huge chance to grow our, Ruby, grow our Ruby. If the framework is not our app, it means so much more of our app can be written in what is effectively plain old Ruby. And that's glorious. And when we build confidence with Ruby, it will do wonders for our ability to think and then problem solve fluently in this language. And we might even begin to see Ruby through a new lens. What we might discover is that when we create objects with injected dependencies that then offer one or more methods that receive arguments and return a value, but otherwise do not modify the internal state of that object, well then that begins to look a little bit like functional programming. And that can bring so much more clarity to the flow of our code. And every core Hanami component is built along these principles. So you have great examples to follow as well. And then when you do pick up Hanami, it can help, ex help us experience a whole new part of the Ruby ecosystem, because it builds on and around uh, that rich heritage of gems that support Ruby apps of all flavors, like Dryab and Roma B and others. And we might find inspiration for our own code from how these gems solve their problems. So I think we've got many chances to grow. And if we get back to our original, original premise, uh, new framework, new you, uh, I just want to dwell on that for a minute. And I know we've seen many new things, and, and that might be overwhelming. But I want to reassure you with a story. I know new framework, new you is possible because I lived it myself. And for me, it started around seven years ago. And at that time, I'd already been writing Ruby for a long time, but I was still dissatisfied with how my apps were turning out. I knew I wanted something different, but I didn't know how it should look. So rather than looking around for a different language, I just looked around what was there in the Ruby ec ecosystem. I found the ROM gem for starters. Then I also found a another gem called Rota, which is a standalone routing toolkit. And from these gems and their ideas and the people and community behind them, well, it opened up a whole new world to me. And then it was a matter of one thing leading to another. I gave the gems a try, and then I put them in some apps. And then after a while, my apps began to change shape as, uh, as I better understood the ideas. And then now here I am having found some people and helped to build a range of gems to make these ideas hopefully more accessible than ever. So it's been the most fulfilling seven years of my Ruby life. And what I hope can be clear is that no matter where you are on your journey as a developer or with Ruby, there is always the chance to take things in a new direction. So with that in mind, I just want to boost you up just to finish off. Uh, if we were to make a resolution uh, to try something different, uh, I would suggest, well, let's be curious. Uh, there's lots out there to learn. The Ruby ecosystem is bigger than you think, and maybe Hanami can be your gateway to something new. Be bold. If you find something interesting, give it a try. 
And if that feels uncomfortable, uh, well, that's probably a good sign. It means you're learning. Be excited. Uh, I know I am. I think we're at the beginning of another special moment for Ruby, a uh, resurgence of new ideas. Uh, and this is your chance to be a part of it. And lastly, be persistent. You can always try and try again. And just to leave uh, one last Aussie reference here, uh, imagine your opportunity is like a packet of Tim Tams that never ends. You can always uh, grab another one and try things again. So that is everything from me. If you'd like to learn more, uh, check out the Hanami site. Uh, we've got a great getting started guide that we wrote uh, for this release. I'm also developing a complete open source example app. It's called Decaf Sucks. It's on GitHub. Uh, I'm only just getting started, so if you'd like to follow along, now's a great chance to see how these apps are put together. And lastly, I'm always up for a chat. Find me on the conference. Uh, mention me on Mastodon. Uh, let's have a talk. Thank you very much.